Bible. If you have your scripture, let's go to John chapter two. John chapter two, you can follow along also on your smartphones. Uh, we've got uh, all of the version scriptures are plugged in there. But John chapter two, we started a five-part series last week, and this series is called Do Whatever He Tells You. Do whatever he tells you. Do whatever he tells you. These five words are in a passage of scripture where Jesus captures really the first miraculous event that we have in the Bible. And it's there at the wedding of Cana where he turned water into wine. Pretty incredible miracle. Particularly if you're from the Willamette Valley, you're like, wow, okay, I wish that could happen more often. I'm mindful of this. Jason, are you back there? Jason, do you, I just was thinking about this. You remember when you were in a band called Water and Wine? When you were like 14 or something like that? Was that what it's called? Was it Water and Wine? Yes. They were epic. It was epic. No, it wasn't. I loved it. I loved your stuff. Okay. Water and Wine, I don't know why I just thought of that. Okay, well, this miraculous event, it was verified a number of ways. And, and it was verified in the fact that the master... The master uh, at the banquet tasted what was brought to him and said, this is the best wine ever. You've saved the best for last. It was verified in the fact that the disciples, they got to see the whole thing happen in front of their very eyes. Imagine being those guys just kind of watching this unfold in the way that Jesus worked. And and that was just the beginning of of mind-blowing events in their life. You can just imagine the stuff that they got to see. The blind uh, recovered sight, the the, the, the dead raised from, from dead. I mean, just incredible stuff that they got to witness. It was also verified in the fact that the servants, the ones who were told to do a series of things, that they filled up these six jars with water. They knew it was water. Okay, right out of the tap, you know what I'm saying? And then they brought a cup of it to the master, and they knew they were bringing water. And then that master verified that this is the best wine he's ever tasted. So, I mean, imagine those guys going, we could lose our life right now. And that's how serious this event was for them. They could lose their life only to discover Jesus had done a miraculous work and they were now a part of something so significant. It was also verified by mom. Verified by a feisty mom named Mary. How many moms are mostly feisty? That's just kind of like, that goes together, right? So a feisty mom that just said five explosive words to the servants. Do whatever he tells you. Last week, we started with do. Do. Let me recap it for you. Be obedient, we said, okay? Be passionate. Be people that fill the jars up to the rim. Not halfway, not partway, not sort of the top. Don't leave any room. Fill it to the brim. But also, be patient, understanding that these kinds of commands that you're giving to you in sequence. They're going to come to you as you take a step. They're going to come as you're being obedient. You don't have everything laid out for you. You aren't given the master plan saying, here's the rest of your life. Just just follow this. No, if you're like me, every day is a step in the direction towards the Lord saying, I'm just going to be obedient today. I don't know what, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you. I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know I'm just going to follow you today. Jesus lived this out. He lived it out all through the Gospels. He says, I live to do the will of God, the Father. And I live to finish the work of the Father. The whole point in which Jesus came was to do the will of God and to finish the work of God. When you look at Philippians chapter 2, it tells us to continue to work. Everyone say work, real loud. Work. Work out your salvation with fear and with trembling. Okay, and we could just stop there, but there's more. I'll get to the more in a second, but work out your salvation. In other words, there's something he's calling us to do. Work out your salvation with fear and with trembling. In other words, with awe, with esteem for God. Work out your salvation. But now, let's go on to the rest of the verse. For it is God who works. Everyone say works. In you to will and to do according to his good purpose. So this isn't just about uh, what you can do. It's about what God does in you to accomplish his will. 
and to actually do it. Now, let me just put it this way. Some of us have a lot of desires. We have the will, you know. It's like, well, I have the will to do this, but I'm not actually gonna do it, right? Like, uh, here we are at the 10 o'clock service, and some of you this morning thought to yourself, I'm gonna get up early this morning. I am. No, I'm not. No, no, that ain't gonna happen, Right? Right, so the, I mean, it's like the, the desire was there initially, but the actual doing, now that's a whole nother, whole nother deal. And here we have this work that we're called to do, but it's God that works in us to will and to do according to his good purpose. I'd put it this way. If I were to paraphrase this passage, I'd say, God works in you to will and to do in order to do his will. That's John Phelan 316 right there, okay? <laughs> right? All right, pa- Pastor Jack Hayford, a mentor of mine, has said it, I think, better. He says, without him, without him, we cannot. But without us, he will not. Okay, without God, we can't do anything. But without us, he, he chooses not to. In other words, he's gonna accomplish his will through human people. That's us. So, do Okay, do what? Do what? Well, if you're following along, it's do whatever. Do whatever. Whatever. Now, here's the way we tend to live it. Here's the, ten, here's the way we tend to do it. Now, nod your head with me if you feel this at all. What? Never. Right? We have a what never approach to things rather than a whatever. It's what? Never. You know, we hear things from God or someone asks us to do something or you're called to be obedient in a certain area. You're like, what? I'm sorry, what? Never, no, not gonna happen. Especially when the whatever that's been brought to us stretches us. Especially when it hurts us a little bit. Especially when it calls us to to give or it calls us to serve or it calls us to, to apply time or energy Take it a little further. If that whatever is embarrassing, potentially embarrassing to us, right? Or it requires us to change. Or if it's even slightly inconvenient. That's a big one, right? Don't bother me. Ugh. We hear the whatever, we get a sense from the Lord, we're called to do something, but man, if that's gonna cost us, if that's gonna stretch us, if that's gonna move us in a direction that could be potentially embarrassing or inconvenient, we're like, no, never, never. But, but think about this, think about it this way. Think about how thin your Bible and my Bible would be if this had just what? Nevers in it. Now, I know that there are times that there are people in the scriptures, that it's been captured, that didn't respond to the Lord. You know, it's Jonah running away from God. No, no, what? Never. Okay, we do have a few of those stories in the scripture, but by and large, this is a book that captures a lot of whatever. Whatever you tell me to do, Lord, I'm gonna do it. This whatever approach is so important. We see it all throughout Scripture. Matter of fact, I'll take you through Scripture right now. We're going to start at the beginning. We're going to go to the end, okay? How much time do we have? What time is lunch again? Okay, all right. No, here we go. I'll do it fast, okay? I mean, just kind of start at the beginning. Let's go with Noah. Noah, build a boat, Noah. Excuse me? Build a boat. Okay, i got to find my tools. I don't even know. Why, why, why a boat? Because it's going to flood. Now, this may not seem like a big deal to anyone, but they had never seen rain, okay? That was in, 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 inconceivable, right? All right, Noah, do something, do it now, be ready, even though you don't know what's coming. Abram, now that's short for Abraham. Before his name was changed, he was Abram. Abram was told, leave your home and go to a place that I'm gonna show you. Leave where, what? Leave my home, leave your home. Gather all your family, gather all your animals, gather everything Pack it up and start walking. Walking to where? The kids are gonna wanna know. My wife's gonna wanna know. Just start walking and I'll show you as you go. The kids are like, where are we going? I don't know. I have to go to the bathroom. Just go. I don't know. I, 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 we don't, when are we gonna stop? I don't, this is just a journey in a direction towards the leading of the Lord. Okay, he gets wherever he's supposed to end. He stops there, obeys the Lord. And now he's told, you're gonna be the father of many nations. Well, we don't even have kids. 
really. We don't have, I mean, this is all about my extended family, but we don't have any personal children between me and my wife, and we're upwards of 100 years old right now. Yes, you're going to have children. Now, I'll fast forward. I'll, we'll fill in some gaps as we go here, but, but listen, you remember when he had Isaac? Or she had Isaac. He had very little to do with it, but uh, when Sarah has Isaac. And they're like, that's the promised child. Great. And he's holding up Isaac. Yes, Lord, thank you. And he hears the voice of the Lord. Now kill him. Go kill him. Sorry? Go kill your son. Take him to the top of the mountain and kill him. He goes, oh, he's obedient. He packs wood. He's going to go sacrifice his son on top of the mountain. Hikes up to the top of the mountain. Knife is out, ready to, you follow me now? And the Lord goes, stop. I just wanted to make sure you are with me. Stop, I've provided another sacrifice for you. That, 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 the whole picture is just beautiful. It speaks to the whole sacrifice of Jesus that's coming. Okay, that's, I can't even go that, down that road. Well then, what do I have this knife here for, Lord? Okay, well here's why you have it. I want you to circumcise yourself. Uh, uh, baking soda, what? <laughs> what? Yeah, I want you to circumcise yourself. Do it yourself. No, can I get it? Is there a doctor in the house? No, do it yourself. Do it yourself. Now, let's get off of that. Let's talk about Moses. Okay. <laughs> Moses. Moses, take your staff, tap the rock, water's going to come out of it. Water's coming out of a rock? Yes, just tap it with that stick that you have in your hand. Water's going to come. Just do it. Joshua, put your foot in the water. Why? Well, you've got an enemy behind you. There's water in front of you. Put your foot in it. He, he's not told that it's going to split. He's only told to put his foot in the water. That's it. And when he put his foot in the water, the water split. They went across on dry land. They get into the, into the promised land. There's enemies. There's giants in that land. They try to occupy a place called Jericho. What are they told to do to occupy that city? March around the city seven times. We look stupid. <laughs> Just keep doing it, right? Okay, so that's what's happening. You with me? So where are we at? We're, well, we're only about here. Sorry about that. Okay, let's keep moving. David. David, you've got an enemy in front of you. His name is Goliath. What does David choose to do? He finds five smooth stones out of a creek bed, gets his sling out. He's used to using a sling. He's used to throwing rocks. Why? Because he's kept away bears. He's kept away lions. He's kept away wolves from his sheep. And now this is just another in the line of enemies trying to attack. And he takes one right in the middle of the forehead, kills him dead. Hosea, let's talk about him for a second. What's he told to do in the scripture? Marry a prostitute. What? Yeah, marry a prostitute. Now, friends, along with the whole circumcise yourself, let's not do that, okay? Let's not obey that scripture, all right? But it's a story. It's an analogy. Why? Because that prostitute was like the people of Israel, which is like us. We're the ones that give ourselves to other gods all the time. And yet the Lord invites us back and continues to love us and to receive us. What about Ezekiel? Ezekiel's a big book. There's a lot of things he was told to do. I'll just draw out a couple of them. Um, I want you to lay on your, on your left side for 390 days, Ezekiel. Just lay there. Lay there for 390 days. Okay, what do I do after 390 days? Well, I want you to flip over to your right side and now for 40 more days lay on that side. What am I supposed to eat? How, how do I, okay, you can have bread, but you only cook it over a fire, and that fire is to be fueled by human feces. Read your Bible. It's in there. And you may think to yourself, well, that, that's just, God's just weird. Yeah, and there's a lot of things we don't understand. We don't really get why. There's a lot of imagery. There's a lot of symbolism. There's a lot of nuance that we can't exactly pull out, which is why we should jump Clear over to the New Testament now. Jesus. Jesus. He put mud in a blind guy's eye and said, go wash off and, and you'll be healed. Jesus was one who told some disciples, go get me a donkey. Go, go to a house, ask him for the donkey, tell him the Lord needs it. Okay. Well, that's not our property. Why would, why? Just do it. Just do it. A little boy there on a hillside has a lunch. You know, mom packed a lunch. When mom packed that lunch that day, she wasn't thinking about feeding thousands of people. Neither was that little boy. He's got his granimals in there. He's got his, you know, <laughs> gogurts and, you know, whatever else in there. And, and they said, we need your lunch. We need to feed these people. The Lord needs it. 
And Jesus multiplied and fed thousands of people with a little boy's lunch. Imagine four guys. They had a friend who's sick. They said, if we can just get this friend to Jesus, somehow he'll be well. And they carried him on a mat and they got to the house where they heard he was teaching in a house. They went up to the front door. The front door was packed with people. Couldn't get through the front door. They went over to the windows. Windows, there's people everywhere. Went on another side of the house, over to the other window. Can't get over there. What are we gonna do? Let's go through the roof. They climbed up on top, lifted him up. They started digging in through the roof. They lowered the guy down. Jesus looked up at them and says, now there's faith. Now there's faith. He commended them for trying to get their dying friend to the Lord. Friends, when I think about the uh, whatever it takes kind of mentality, I think about these guys that filled up the jars, took a glass of it, and carried, even though they knew it was water, carried it to the master. Here you go. Well, I mean, what, what, what were they to think? Friends, when you give someone water, think about this in, 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 in if you ever travel, I travel all the time over in other, uh, other parts of the world. You don't drink the water. Don't drink the water. I think that's also why uh, Paul told Timothy, Timothy, take some wine for your stomach ailments. Why? Because you're probably drinking the water that's making you sick. Drink something else. So imagine now giving this guy the water. It's like, oh, you probably shouldn't drink this, but here you go. Jesus told me to give it to you. And it ends up being the best wine ever. Someone once said, faith is spelled R-I-S-K. Risk. Just risk it. Just try something. Just try something. Stuff that often flies in the face of logic. I mean, when you have facts presented to yourself, and some of you have received facts. You've had doctors give you facts. You've had, you've had individuals spell things out for you and say, this is the way it is. And you've looked at it and said, but that's not the God that I serve. I think there's more. When you have everything presented to you, logic is right there, facts are right there, and yet you know there's something miraculous in the works. Think about this in your own life, and I I don't want this to be so ethereal that you're just kind of looking out there at all these big, grandiose things, but think about your own personal life. Where have you seen that in your life there are things that didn't make sense that you've been asked to do? Things that were crazy, Now, I'm not talking about being a loopy Christian. I'm not talking about being a nutto. I'm not talking about being off your rocker. And I I tell you, and I hope there's no one like this in this room, but I can't stomach when you see and you hear things of crazy, crazy people that will justify things according to Scripture or according to the will of God. I think the most recent we'd be aware of is that family that held all their children captive in their home. They held them. Why? Well, God told us. We're Christians. This is what we do. Friends, no, it's not what you do. Stop that. I'm not talking about being nuts. I'm not talking about losing your ability to have cognitive thought. I'm not talking about checking your brain at the door or being so open-minded that your brains leak out. Okay? That's not what I'm talking about. However, I am a proponent of the fact that sometimes things may defy reason, which is what makes it a miracle, okay? Sometimes the Lord's going to ask us to do things. I want to respond. Sometimes God's going to ask you to speak to a person. What are you going to do? Sometimes God's going to ask you to share your faith or give or care for someone that you don't understand all the reasonings why, or take someone into your home, or give someone a vehicle, or all those kinds of things. We could go on and on and on. He could lead you in a particular direction that doesn't make absolute sense. But here's what I want you to remember. We talked about it earlier. Okay, God works in us to will, in other words, the desire, and then to do according to his good purpose. Okay, and I believe, and I'd be curious to see what you think about this, just through a nod or a wink or something that says, and I believe God has significant purposes for us to accomplish. Do you believe that? Hallelujah. I think he does. Now, I'm gonna make sure you're getting this because I think about seven of you were interested in this, but this, there's gotta be more. Think about God's significant purpose. I mean, just muse on that for a second. We're talking about the God of the universe who put the earth in place, 
who put the moon, the stars. He created mankind and animals. I mean, think about that God. Okay, not some cosmic deity that's just out there, nebulous. We're talking about a God, though, that has a personal relationship with each and every one of us, okay? So not just out there, but right here, in here. Would it stand to reason that that God has significant purpose for you and I? Or are we just existing? We're just here. We're just floating. And this may be how some of you feel in your life. You may go, I don't know. I just, I get up in the morning and I just sort of, next thing I know, I'm laying down at night and I do it again and do it again and do it again. Oh, sure. I know some of you may have work. You may have obligations. You may have challenges that are keeping you kind of socked in, if you will, almost like a fog that you just go, I don't know. I'm just, I can barely see my way forward. Okay, I want to speak some hope into you. God has significant purpose for your life. See, and it's, got to, it's beyond just what you're seeing right now. It may involve exactly what you're doing right now. You would say, okay, I, I hear you, pastor. You're right. Something significant. I need to leave my family. I need to divorce my wife. I need to let my kids. I'm going to pursue that. No, don't you dare. Don't you dare. What you do significantly happens in those contexts as well. Okay? So God's significant purpose. I wonder if you could just kind of say those three words, but just as you're saying it, almost like you're prophesying to your own heart, like you're just, God's significant purpose. Saying it out loud is going to just rouse something. Okay, can we do that together? Here we go. God's significant purpose. Let's try one more time. God's significant purpose. Now, how's that accomplished? It's accomplished through our simple and small acts of obedience. That's how it gets done. Okay, lest we think this is just something so grand and so otherworldly and so out there and so cosmic that the Lord would say, I'm going to do my significant purposes in here. I'm going to do them through very simple, small points of obedience. Okay, let's go back to the text, John chapter 2. What should we do? Well, we should fill the jars. To the brim, fill them up. What should we do next? We should go and draw some out. Just a cup, okay. What do I do now? Right there. Okay, now go take it to the master. And if you could picture almost like a, 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 a child, when, they, when, a, when the parent expresses, oh man, I wish I had some milk for my coffee right now, and that look is like, oh, okay, okay, and runs to the kitchen. And goes and gets the big old jug of 2% milk out, you know, takes the lid off and is starting to work his way towards you and it's heavy and he's spilling it everywhere. Oh, sure, we're going to make a mess. Oh, yeah, we're going to bobble it. We're not going to do it perfectly, but what are we called to do? Fill the jars, draw some out. Now take it to the master. Just take it to him. Do your best to get it to him. Spill a little, that's fine. It's okay. That's called grace. But you fill the jar. You draw some out. And you take it to the master. Now, those are simple. Those are small points of obedience. But watch what happens, okay? Let's, let's watch this. It's almost like, you know, you just bring these two together and you, poof, just something magical starts to take place. Watch what happens. Jesus turns it into wine. Our little simple, our little small Oh, just that's all I did. I filled it up. I took it. I just did what you told me to do. Yeah, you did what I told you to do, and I did what I tend to do. Miraculous things. I made a miracle happen because of your obedience. And here's the miraculous. The miraculous is right there in the midst of the mundane. A lot of us can look at things like Noah, we can look at Abraham, we can look at David, we look at all these guys, these giants in the faith, and we go, I can't build a boat, I can't kill a giant. These are all just simple acts of obedience. They just did whatever the Lord told them to do. 
Unless you think that you have to somehow bring all of your big old works to, the, to bear on this, you don't. You just bring what is small and simple and allow the miraculous to happen right there in the midst of the mundane. So our small becomes, wait for it, God's big. It's God's big. It's not our big, it's God's big. A.W. Tozer, I'm gonna finish with this. A.W. Tozer said something years ago that has stuck with me since and has been shaping my life for many, many years. He said, God is looking for people through whom he can do the impossible. What a pity that we plan only the things we can do ourselves. Think about it. We just, I got this, Lord. No, you just bring what you have and let him do the rest. He's looking for people like us, simple, small people in which he can do the impossible. Are you willing? Are you willing? I, I, my prayer for you and my prayer for me is that we would be on board to do whatever. <laughs> whatever. Not what? Never. But instead, whatever. All right, why don't you pray with me?